So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is, wherever you are. My name is Anish DeVos, and welcome back to the most glamorous, the most ponderful, the most fantastic. Oh my God, David, it's been far too long. Happy New Year, albeit we're in February. Welcome back, David. How are you? Happy New Year, he says. <laughs> Thank you again for that wonderful introduction, Anish. You are uh, very, very welcome. Hello, it's good to see you um, and everyone else uh, when you catch up with this. Absolutely. But enough of you, David. Enough of you. <laughs> As ever, I am, I am like beyond excited today. It's not <laughs> even terribly excited. It's ridiculously excited. And I am going to introduce kind of, if not my most favourite busker to date, yeah, I think he definitely is. His name is Sean Bullshields. He is a First Nation from the Blackfoot Confederacy, Alberta, Canada. Um, Sean, honest to God, just terribly excited because we've never had a live singer on, which is just amazing. And I know you're going to sing for us. Um, well, it's our tonight, but it's your morning, isn't it? It is 11.30. 11.30. Yeah. 7.30 um, with us. 7.30 with us. Hence why I always have this kind of elongated, you know, whatever time it is, because we do have guests from different places. But um, you are our first um, singer and we are, as I've said, extremely excited. David, you are excited too, aren't you? Yes, I am. And um, particularly so since you sent me a link to uh, some of Sean's work and he played one of my all-time favourites, which is Father and Son. Um, mm -hmm. So that blew me away. And I hope is the first of many. Or, yeah, we are going to mix it up a little bit, aren't we? We are. Definitely, we are. So, <clears throat> Sean, I first, well, I heard you because I like have this x-ray hearing when I hear <laughs> live music <laughs> and I heard you on the lovely Granville Island in Vancouver and I heard this voice and I literally, my little magnet, my <laughs> live music magnet, flew me over to sit on these lovely um, benches and that and you were singing, and I was just like, oh my life, this man is amazing. So that was back in 2017, couldn't get enough of you, came back in 2018, couldn't get enough of you, came back in 2019. Sean, why are you a busker? What is it? What, I mean, apart from the fact that you're a very talented musician, but why? Why in the street? What was that about? Uh, I've been told uh recently by people that support me is like, don't call yourself a busker, you're a musician. And, yeah. And so, so um, that's their opinion. Um, and, uh, but I had become a, a musician because of being a busker. So Granville yeah. Island, actually, uh, we should be calling ourselves, but we are street musicians when you look at us uh, with our guitar cases out. Um, well, you want the short answer or you want the long answer? I want whatever answer you want to give. <laughs> We've got time. Give you a, a medium kind of answer. So, I uh, my journey uh, started uh, in sobriety when I was 34 years old, and so in sobriety uh, from alcohol and drugs, um, and I uh, taught myself a few trades because I really didn't know anything before. I knew how to really self-destruct really well and, and do alcohol and drugs and do all that. I, I was an expert, you know, you know, I was like a really good contractor in that. But when I got sober, I found I just, I had nothing. And so I had to learn things along the way. And I'm a stubborn guy and I never really did well with people guiding me what to do. So I always just kind of tried to learn things myself. One of them was like, I always had a, a belief in my voice, a small belief, and but I never knew how to play guitar, so I would chip away at the guitar. Um, but you know, it was kind of like a little hobby, and uh, uh, I eventually I became a, a full-time drywaller. I taught myself how to do that trade, and found I made good money at it. So I, I did that, and and uh, 
and very long, long nights and stuff, and hard, hard days. So I would, didn't have very much. I would go to the, the odd open mic um, and usually be terrible. Um, sweaty palms, forget lyrics, uh, screw up on a guitar, leave saying I'm never going to do that again. I'm not a musician. All these bad words going in my head. And uh, about, um, let's say, um, 11 years into my, my uh, recovery, so uh, about six and a half years ago, I uh, hurt my shoulder from all the ceiling work that I was doing in, 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 uh, in drywalling. And we took, the, took a vacation to the Dominican Republic, my wife and I, and, and I was playing volleyball and I threw my shoulder out just doing an overhand serve. Never do an overhand serve when you haven't played volleyball in 20 years. <laughs> For anybody that uh, wants to mess their shoulder up, because it, it, my shoulder just looked down from there, and every job was painful. I had chronic pain. Um, MRI showed a tear in my shoulder. I had to uh, go through uh, all the anxiety of surgery or no surgery, physio, and, and lots of things weren't working, so I ended up going for the surgery thinking that, you know, the baseball pitcher that goes for the shoulder surgery is going to go back and pro pitch. I don't think so. Um, so I tried to be a drywaller after that, and it just failed miserably because my shoulder was just aching more and more. Um, so uh, my wife uh, was working at Grand Island part-time, and she would, um, she would see these, you know, on her little breaks or walks around Grand Island to do her business. She would see these buskers and she would sit down sometimes and listen to some of them. And she'd come home and I'd be, I'd be bitching after, a, a, pardon the language, I'd, after a job and I, my shoulder would be hurting and I'd pop another Advil and, and she would say very gently, you know, I see these guys down there, maybe you could, maybe you could be one of those guys. You're very good and, and, and I said, nah. I, I remember watching a fellow down there a friend of mine, he said, Sean, I really want you to come and see me uh, play at Granville Island. And I went down, this was about um, 15 years ago. He's a country singer. And I remember sitting there on the 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and I think he made $3. And I was, and the immediate thought that came through my head was like, well, he's really good, and why isn't people, you know, why aren't they throwing any money in? And I thought, you never catch me doing this, you know, no way. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't have that thick skin like that. And then, you know, fast forward, um, like she would give me these gentle uh, reminders. Um, and, you know, one night I just was open and, uh, and I knew I had a couple of videos that, and one of them was actually Father and Son by Cat Stevens, David. And uh, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't very, I didn't think it was a very good recording. I didn't really put a lot of emphasis on what I did musically. Um, but I just was, wow, I got that on video and, and I, you know, did it through my Mac and all, all that stuff. And, and so I, um, I gotta stay in the story here. Uh, so when I, um, she said, you can do it all online. And I said, oh, wow, okay, yeah, let's do it. So I uploaded the video, I filled out the form and I sent it in and it was a Wednesday and they said they had to look at it from Thursday and Friday, the audition process. And then they'd give me a, a call Tuesday or Wednesday. So the Wednesday I filled out the form. Thursday afternoon I'm sitting at home and I get a phone call from the director of the program. And she says, you're in, come down and pick up your license. I said, well, I said, you're supposed to call me next week. And she said, you, you belong down here. So I was like, and I remember falling back on the couch after the phone call and I was like, I never passed an audition in my life. Like, <laughs> I, you know, like I just never, anyway, I, I had a little bit of a tear and, I, and then I felt stupid when I got up. Why am I, you know, why am I crying? It's just a, like I started belittling the, the bigness of my emotion of it all. And, and, uh, and then, so I went down the next day and I, I, I walked around. I, I said, you know, I don't think I'll busk today, uh, but I'll, and I was on a big job, I was on a big, um, townhouse job doing some carpentry at the time with a partner of mine and so I knew I was busy with that and so I said I, I'm gonna take a day and I'm gonna go check out this busking thing and so I went and I checked out everybody's system and what they were singing and and, and uh, you know the, the genres and 
and, and I just I checked it all out, what the gears that they were working, and I thought, okay, what do I have at home? And I, I kind of like went home, and I, and I put together some songs, and I told my buddy, I said, went to work the next day, and the next day it was sunny. I said, you know, if you don't mind, Richard, uh, I think I'm going to check out this Granville Island for a day and see if I could see if I make some money or uh, see what, what happens. And uh, so I, I went down this day. It was, a, it was um, it actually, the sun was out, but then it got cloudy and it's at the verge of rain. And, and I sat down and I, I couldn't, I didn't have, uh, I couldn't um, play guitar standing up because I had to see what I was doing. And right. I wasn't very confident. So I bought this little Canadian tire chair, if you have Canadian tire in London or in England, um, anyway, like a hardware store, and a uh, $20 chair, and I sat down very low on the ground, and uh, I, I got my pedal and my, my little pipsqueak amplifier, and I set it out on the side, and, and I sang, and I just, I couldn't put my head up, because I just had to focus on what I was doing, so the microphone was down here, my head was down. And, and when I got done that hour, I had sixty dollars in my uh, in my case. Wow! I didn't, I didn't know that uh, there was um, like I, I really wasn't paying attention to the people that were coming up. I thought I, I probably didn't make any money. And and uh, right after that set, uh, this old fellow came up to me, and I guess they had an old folks home um, that had been watching, and they invited me to. Um, possibly do an old folks gig for them. But I was just blown away that, uh, that I made that much money and, and I did another one and I only made $10 at that one. But I, I, went, I went away thinking to my, I talked to my, my, my friend was a music, musician, musician as well. And uh, he, he said, oh, that, that, that's, that's cool. And I said, well, I think, if you don't mind, um, I think I'm gonna take the sunny days of September. I started in September of 2015. I think I'm gonna take the sunny days and see if I can See if I can do this thing. Maybe you just amp up my amplifier. And so I went down for a couple of days at a time, and I was like, wow, this is, and I did three or four spots, and then one day I did five spots, and I came home really happy, and I thought, hmm. I said, you know, maybe I'm going to build myself a dolly and put the bigger speakers on there so I can have two of them so my sound is bigger. And, and I started, and I said, this is my stage for an hour. Like, wow, I can do whatever I want within mm -hmm. reason. And... That, so that's what it, where it started, and then eventually I told, and I went on a weekend one day, and my weekend was phenomenal, and uh, the, the, not so much what I, well, 50-50 would say, like what I made, and, but the people that, that came up to me and told me things like, never give up, don't give up, because I was always putting myself down about a guitar, and they'd come up and compliment me, and I'd have a, I'd say something negative about it. Well, thank you very much, buddy. You know, and and so like all of these people, you should be on the voice and all of these things. Uh, it just blew me away. And I remember that weekend that that happened, walking back to my truck, and I had a tear in my eye. <laughs> yeah, it was it's kind of bringing me back. But you know, I I, uh, I was like, what the hell? Like you know, what's happening? Like, you you want me to quit construction? Is that it? You know, and I did. Wow! So, yeah, I stopped. So I've I've not I've not had to um, through COVID. I've I've had to do uh, do some things, but for the most part, music has been uh, the sole provider of, um, of of my living. Wow! Five it, years. It years. sounds as if it was it was it was meant to be, but you were a bit of a a reluctant starter. Yeah, yeah, and it was, uh, you know, days when I'd be really down on myself, you know, and, uh, whether that be uh, just from my own personal depression that I kind of live with, um, there would be somebody that would come up and say, you're really good, never give up what you're doing. Oh my God, yeah. like, you know, they just give me less, all these, there's just so many messages and and what people had to say to me. And some yeah. of them never knew me other than hearing me sing. And, and I just found it like, what am I gonna, what am I gonna experience today? You know, what, what, what is Granville Island gonna bring to me today? And who is they, they gonna bring to me, you know? So it, and, you know, and, and in that, like, uh, you know, I had, um, I just thought like, this is like gold for me. Like when I started to finally see 
And I grew up uh, on my reservation in Alberta with community. Like every day there was a building on the reserve that, that, that you did all the administrational stuff where the bank was, the lands department, the welfare department, the supermarket, and the cafe, and everybody congregated there every day. So my grandpa was a security guard at the time, a retired RCMP officer, but he went from the security, security guard. So every day um, I would, people would congregate at the cafe and they smoke cigarettes and drink coffee when you could smoke and do that in the cafe. And uh, I just loved going and seeing everybody every day. So I was very community, and I didn't even know how to say this until my wife came back to the reserve with me and she saw what, what I had grown up in and mentioned to me this is that you, she witnessed me on Granville Island being very, all the vendors know me. Um, I, I started to create fans. I, every day I start my day with uh, going to say hi to the vendors and, and enjoy some of the weather and then, you know, very community. So she said, Granville Island has become your community. So it, it, you know, from a being a kid to ending up at, at a Granville Island in a very diverse, quite opposite, there's a quite a, quite a big contrast there. Yeah. If I'm saying the words correctly, I'm trying to sound intelligent. But, you know, <laughs> we do uh, as well. <laughs> all, of, all of my lingo has been picked up over the years. I didn't really stay long in school, but. Um, okay. And so from that very uh, segregated reserve that I, I don't know if I, I said that correctly, but, you know, we were a reserve. So the white, uh, white towns were among, around us. And, and, and I'll say it, it was very oppressive to live there. I felt very oppressed. And, okay. and there, there was the difference, right? There was the difference. I don't care what anybody says. There, there was a difference. My wife felt it even when we were there. Um, so it was very hard living there. And, uh, and then to, to come from that, and even in my addiction, I stayed in that mentality, even though I moved around, I could not, I could not assimilate, if that's the word that I'm looking It is for. the word. I couldn't, I couldn't infiltrate into the rest of society and feel uh, worthy of being there f for, for my own story. Yeah. I just felt like less than, and, and I was made to feel that growing up. Uh, or not made to feel that, but I chose to feel that because of the circumstances that I was living in. So coming from that into Granville Island and, uh, and even in my recovery, all the contracting that I did, and I had to do it for every walk of life, um, I had to learn how to be in all of this society. And I think for many years since I was a teenager, I tried to I tried to um, be clean and sober, and I believe the reason why I couldn't be clean and sober was because I always thought the same way, and I thought I had to be around my people all the time, and, and that's not true for me. That's not true for me because my, I'm beginning to know myself, and I need, I need the world, you know, I need... I need yeah. I always knew that growing, growing up on the reserve. I love my family and my reserve and every, everything there. It's just that I always felt like there's bigger things out there for me. And I didn't know what that looked like. And drugs and alcohol always made me almost die to where I could probably never, ever see that. Yeah. And I always knew I was living on that edge that I could die. And sometimes there were suicide attempts and sometimes there wasn't. And so now that I'm... When I got into Granville Island, I thought, you know, people respect me for what I'm doing and they respect me for Sean. You yeah. know? And I, there's a bit, lot, lots of lessons along the way. And, and now I do feel part of the world, but at the same time, I still very much respect where I come from as, as a Blackfoot member and First Nations person in this world. And, uh, and honor that very much. Um, so that's the long answer. <laughs> Do you know what? It was, a, it was a beautiful answer. And Sean, if you can keep me quiet for almost 20 minutes, that's pretty good going, isn't it, David? Thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah, thanks. That is so Thank important. 
really is. Sean, David likes father and son. You couldn't possibly play that for us, could you? <laughs> I want to play whatever he wants to play. I always go to the song because when, um, when I first started to play at Granville Island, this was one of the songs that uh, really, and here's another story real fast. I, I, my father was estranged to me. My okay. father was my father was white, my mother was black, but they divorced very young. Uh, so the reason why I didn't adopt all of my Blackfoot language was because those years that were so crucial for developmental language learning for me on the reserve weren't there. And mm -hmm. I was, I was uh, off the reserve, so I kind of, I'm trying to get to learn more of that now. I... But so he was estranged to me. Uh, most of my life, if that's the right word. And I met him when I was 39. I was, I was a few years sober. And we formed a relationship for a little while. And suddenly this song started to, that I'd been singing for a long time, started to mean more to me when I met him. And uh, so that relationship was really, it was a relationship that probably wanted to work, but there was a lot of dynamics in there that on both sides, where there, it didn't, it, I don't feel I, feel, I feel, I think we both wanted more, but we couldn't get that. And then he passed away, unfortunately. Okay. Four years ago. So now um, the song, when I sing it, um, just means something different. And it, I never knew that it would uh, mean that for me. So anyway, I'm going to sing this for David. I'm going to sing for anybody who's watching. How's that? Brilliant. We will mute our mics. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear the guitar. It's not time to make a change. Just relax, take it easy, you're still young. That's your fault There's so much you have to know Find the girl Settle down If you want You can marry Look at me I am old But I'm happy And I was once like you are now and I know that it's not easy to be calm When you found something going on But take your time, think a lot Think of everything you got For you will still be here tomorrow But your dreams may not How can I try to explain When I do, it turns away again It's always been the same Same old story From the moment I could talk I was ordered to listen Now there's a way And I know that I have to go away And I know I have to go And it's not time to make a change Just relax Take it slowly, you're still young, that's your fault There's so much you have to go through Find a girl, settle down If you want, you can marry Look at me, I am old, but I am happy All the times that I cried Keeping 
all the things I knew inside it's all but it's harder to ignore you if they were right I'd agree but it's them they know not me now there's a way and I know that I have to go away and I know I have to go. Was, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. Mm. A bit tearful, David, because I have been. Yeah. Uh, it gets you right now, yeah. Really does, mm. and that's obviously something that is really also, like you say, has become a song that means something different to you now. Which, um, mm. and and I th for me, I think I, f I felt that. Um, it's always that song's always about relationships, whether it's father son, father daughter. Um, it's yeah, always cool. is, isn't it? It's always about that. Hmm. I'm a little bit, um, <laughs> a bit quiet tonight. Sean, you spoke though of this, this sense of this personal depression and I'm, I'm hearing that that's something that's part, that's part of you, that's, that's part of, of your life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, uh, from as long as I can remember as a, as a, as a child, a young child, um, I could remember just feeling bad about myself and not not knowing where I fit and um, and not really feeling like I had the the things that a kid I mean I, I've raised my stepson for since he's five years old and I kind of did the opposite of what what was done with me and um, and I found so I, I learned a lot through that and um, and so like I I, I was and all, all I could say was it was it was it was depression. I think it was depression, and it was just not feeling good in life. And for the longest time, I've been a person that that, that regrets things a lot very easily. Um, just uh, it's hard for me to get out of bed most days. Um, uh, but I will admit that getting up to go to Granville Island to sing has been a lot easier to do. Um, in in the in the times that when I was working, with the exception of this year, uh, so I, so I fight that you know and, and and it's not a it's not big enough to to get me back drinking or drugging it's it's and I don't think it's about any of that today it's more about how do I live and manage how I feel every day and what do I need to do to to um, to feel better today who who can I talk to if it gets really bad. Um, might be my wife one day, but sometimes she's a little tired of it. Um, I shouldn't say that for her, but I mean, I, I, I just some, sometimes I get tired of hearing myself, and yeah. it's, it's 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 a redundancy of certain things that 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 uh, kind of um, curse me sometimes. And uh, so yeah, so you know, I got things in place. I got people in place for things when, when things get really tough, and like I, I can talk to people. And sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes that just means me being by myself too. And maybe people have opinions about that being isolation, but it might be solitude for me. It might be sometimes just needing, needing uh, to protect me. Um, and, I, and, I, and when I was a kid, I, I went, I had pets and pets were my people I could talk to. Oh yeah. They never talked back. Oh. And, uh, but they would whimper and miss you. And, and it was just a, yeah. a beautiful feeling to have somebody that if I couldn't get it from somewhere else, I'm just kind of thinking as I go and, and feeling as I go. But the the dog was 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 that person for me. It was that he missed me. Mm. He loved me. He wagged his tail. He went up to me, wanted to hold, be in my arms and stuff mm. like that. And so that was, if I look back, I mean, thank God that I had those pets because they may have they may have very well helped along the way. Yeah. My journey yeah. in life, and uh, so, but yeah, I, I fight, I fight that, and and uh, you know, sometimes I say that, and then people, 
say, you know, uh, you know, they, they kind of like look at it a certain way and I just know not to talk to those people because <laughs> they don't understand. But, yeah. but you know, it's, uh, it's something I live with. And, and, and you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to tell, tell people how, how it is and how I am. I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat things about myself because I just feel like I did that most of my life. So I don't need to do that anymore. And if you like me, you like me. If you don't, well, you know, I'll probably feel bad about it, but hopefully that goes away. But, you know, it's, it's like, I think, I think for me, being an adult and being a sober adult, probably the most important thing is a sober adult. That I have so much freedom and I have so much, thank goodness for my freedom, because I'm not trapped in what I used to live and and the people, I can, I can pick and choose who I want in my circle. And I never was able to do that because I was always following and I was always trying to get attention from certain groups only to walk away rejected and, and, and beating myself up for why, why, who are you? Why did you, why'd you do that? Like, you know, and so there's lots of, yeah, so there's been a lot of, a lot of, uh, but but I, but if I wasn't sober, I probably wouldn't be here. If if I didn't get sober, I would not. I, I really doubt that I'd be here in in this uh, in this world. But but I am, and uh, and and there's things that I can do to manage things along the way so that I can um, feel better. Uh, yeah. I think that's um. I, I, I love your story, Sean. I really, really do. And I, I love the way that you are so open and just so easily sharing who you are and, and standing in your, your own space. And I really like that idea of, you know, isolation and solitude, because sometimes you do need that solitude, don't you, to kind of re-establish where are you in in this space especially if if you are having you know living with with depression as you are and I, I just really appreciate the fact that you, you have shared that and shared it actually I, I don't give a damn about what education you have or haven't had if I'm honest your eloquence and your deep understanding of yourself is just beautiful to witness over to you David what what do you want to say? Well, I, yeah, um, I guess this is rather personal and a bit one-sided, but I'd always said that I'd much prefer spending time with someone in recovery than anybody else, because there's a truth to it. Um, and something else came to mind as well. Someone once said to me that the opposite of addiction is connection, not sobriety, but they, they go hand in hand. And I firmly believe that, yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I, I really appreciate the song. It means a lot to me too. And um, I do appreciate your story. Thanks, David. Yeah. Sean, give us another song. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, you know, so I, I will just will share something about this song. Um, okay. I think for me, music, uh, like I say, I'm stubborn, and uh, if it wasn't for a couple of, um, they were a little older than me, uh, and they invited me to this open mic, and they, uh, they, they were a duo, and um, I knew how to play one song all the way through, it was a song by a Blue Rodeo called Bad Timing, and you probably know it, um, Anish, and um, I, uh, these guys would just let me get up there and beat myself up, you know, like, or, or just beat, like, beat the song, like, and I, I couldn't understand why they just liked me coming back and coming back, but I think they wanted people coming to their open mic and stuff, and I began to, uh, to really look at what they were doing with guitar, one of them was phenomenal guitar, they were, they were both really great guitarists, and, and I remember just watching what they were doing and thinking, okay, next month, because it was only once a month, next month I'm going to go back, and I'm going to, and I had a $500 guitar at the time, um, which is pretty good, you yeah. know, plug in and everything. And, but I, even buying a $500 guitar, I felt guilty about it because I was like, this is, why, why don't you buy a $100 guitar or $200? Because you're just a beginner and 
but for some reason I just my, my head was bigger than and <laughs> they, they would let me play so I'd study what they were doing on a really simple song I was like wow so they used to capo um, they, they, they have a, lot, a few names for it they, they call it a cheater bar they call <laughs> all kinds of stuff so if you don't like doing bar chords and all which I don't like doing which I people make fun of me about that but um, so uh, the guy was using this and uh, so I, uh, for some reason, I had a knack of, so if, if Mike was playing there and Gary was playing there, I was saying, I wonder if I could play here, you know? And I was like, okay, put that thing on and I'd find another chord progression, which maybe it was A, D, E, with the F minor in there or something. And I'd think, wow, that's, that's matching up. Wow, that's, but I'd be doing it from my seat. They'd be playing. So I'd study it all week. And I thought, well, I'm an amateur to these guys, but next week I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you know what, I know that song. Can I play with you guys? And so the next week, next month would come by and I'd play that song with them. And I also kind of was learning a couple other ones. So I'd, I'd back out when I didn't know, but usually, usually I was catching on really fast. And these guys began to enjoy my accompaniment because it was three guitars in three different positions. So it was really cool. What was the question? Why, why did I? Oh, yeah. So, so, so I, I just picked up things along the way. And uh, I picked a lot of things along the way. Uh, but if somebody said, OK, start the song, Sean. Maybe even Gary or Mike said, start the song, Sean. I couldn't. I couldn't. Wow. Because I didn't know how to do intros. I didn't know how to uh, have, a, have a, I felt like I had no beat, like, a, you know, like, like the tapping. And, but yet, when Mike and Gary would start the song, I could fall in very easy. I could fall in very easy, and I could keep into their beat. Provided me that that magic to stay in there in that that pocket. And that, I don't know what the technical terms are, but I could be in that pocket with them and not flounder. And uh, so I've learned. So with Granville Island, I'm a solo guy. So mm. I found that was the biggest thing that I had to learn. Was like, okay, well. There's nobody here to start the song. You have to start the song. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to get better. And so even songs like this one, this song's by Buffalo Springfield. It's called um, uh, For What It's Worth. Um, and I remember trying to play, I tried to play with a lot of songs, but this one in particular was one of the ones I, uh, the beat was strange. It was just strange to me, like, because I was just so used to it. And, and I thought, okay, so I had to find uh, ways to do things on my, with my own beat. I think everybody mm -hmm. has their own beat, a drum. Yeah. To do. And so I had to, so I had to, I always loved the song and I'm saying, oh, I can't do it exactly the way they do it. Or can I, you know? And so this one is kind of my version of um, Buffalo Springfield's For What It's Worth. Something happening here But it is Ain't exactly clear There's a man With a gun over there Telling me You got to beware Think it's time we start Hey, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down What's going down? There's battle lines being drawn. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Young people speak in their minds, getting so much resistance from beyond. It's time we stop. Hey, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. What's going down? Sounds on people in the streets 
singing songs and they're carrying signs mostly saying hooray for our side think it's time we stop hey, hey what's that sound everybody look what's going down stop hey, hey what's that sound everybody look what's going down What's going down? Paranoia strikes deep And into your life it will creep And it starts when you're always afraid Step out of line, the man come to take you away. It's time we stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. What's going down? It's time we stop. Hey, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Just, I mean, seriously, this is like beyond exciting. Like, favorite musician from Canada, and I'm getting literally to sit here and listen to it, and I'm like, oh my life. I don't know about you, David, but seriously, I'm so excited. Sean, you're just bloody amazing. I love I love your voice so much. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I feel so selfish, you know. I, I feel I should be sharing this with a few hundred people. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, we will be, we will be. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Sean, yeah. Sean, when you were when you were, were growing up, when you were tiny, I, I, I shared with you and David earlier, you know, my, my dad um, was a busker musician. Yeah. So I literally have this little girl magnet of, oh, you know, as <laughs> soon as I, I hear live music. So I was really brought up around music. It was really important in our lives. What about you? I think uh, one of the first songs that I heard, and I can't remember how old I was, but I know I probably had Pampers on or something, uh, if anybody can remember that, that, that far back. Maybe I didn't have Pampers, but anyway, I remember being in uh, a small town called Cart Cartston, Alberta. Uh, it's a little Mormon town that uh, kind of was out on the outskirts of our reserve. Uh, and I remember Band on the Run. Yeah. You know the name, name of the song at the time, but band on, mm -hmm. and, and I remember, I just remember being a kid and just my ear was just like, I love that song. I just, yeah. love, I love whatever that is, and uh, I always, it was always, one of these days I hope to sing that song, but I always uh, remembered that. That was one of my smallest memories as far as like. Um, and I remember just feeling good when it was like feeling like we talk about that depressed kid, but I just remember when that song was on, I felt really good. It, it just, it, yeah. I'm not even sure if I sang to it. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but I remember really liking it. Um, and to be honest, uh, throughout my childhood, uh, I don't think, I don't really remember any musical things like in that, in that being a, a young little guy. Um, I remember the band, band on the run thing. Um, and then, so my mother and father had a divorce and long story short is I ended up, uh, my father didn't want us anymore. There was three of us at the time. And, and so I had never really known about the reserve, uh, that I came from the reserve and I knew my mother was dark and from the reserve. I just didn't know a lot about it because we would have little PR, periodic visits here and there. And uh, when, uh, when my dad took us and brought us to my grandparents who were, uh, from the reserve, they, 
to now take care of us. I remember uh, it was it was a, it was like a shockwave. Like like I just I just was over here and now I'm here and this is my big big family. Like if you ever if you ever met all of my family, it'd take a whole hall. You know, like a, you have to rent the hall to mm. have you know hundreds of people. And it, I was overwhelmed with just how many how big extended family. I remember living with my dad for a short period of time in Massachusetts, BC, uh, Queen Charlotte's, BC. Um, before I actually went to my grandparents. And uh, it was just him, and I don't remember, it was a lot, of, and the dog, the dog was a really big part of my life there. And, and uh, so when I was on the reserve, there was so many uh, cousins, I had many uncles and aunties, there were so many cousins, um, and uh, second cousins, and third cousins. And music, I think the radio, uh, Tom Petty was like, he'd be on the radio like, um, uh, well, is the hardest part. Remember that one? Uh-huh. The waiting. I remember hearing that one and just thinking, I just loved that. But then I would have, there was a lot of heavy metal growing up, like in that time of my life. And like I say, I followed those people and I was trying to sing in that high register and I couldn't. But I, so I, I didn't really like it. And, uh, but, but yet when I heard things like Cat Stevens or the Eagles, all of these. So I had this uncle that uh, he had this, this like this case of like LPs, you know, back in the days, and he had these big, tall t- Pioneer speakers that were just like. And he he'd leave the house, and I would I would sneak in his room, and and I really liked the Eagles, and so I put the Eagles on. I put uh, I am the Walrus from the Beatles on, and yeah. you know all of these songs and I just really was liking coming through the custom speakers and then I got back to hanging out with this little gang I was involved with uh, banging out heavy metal and not really liking it so I didn't really have a sense of a lot of a lot of music a, a lot and my life was my life was pretty much being stoned and waiting for the next drunk to happen yeah. um, and usually when the next drunk happened uh, lots of destruction happened and, and craziness. Uh, so it wasn't until I went to my first treatment center in Oklahoma and uh, I heard a song coming out of uh, a doorway from one of the residents, fellow residents, and um, it was called Night They Drove Old Dixie Down by the band. Yeah. And I remember the timbre of the guy's voice, and I guess that would be, what's his name, Levon? Um, yeah. He was drumming, and, and I watched the video of him. He's drumming and singing, and I thought, wow. But the timbre of his voice in that song, and the music, and the harmonies, I was like, I gotta get, I don't know what that is, or who that is, I gotta get that album. Like, and I never felt so passionate about it. Stuff like that, there was little things along the way that, and people's voices, James Taylor, uh, James Taylor's greatest hit, Something in the Way She Moves. I remember singing in that a cappella. Uh, country music really, um, so it didn't start happening for me until I started to, I believe I grew up very, very young. So I think maybe when I was 12 or 13, I was like, felt like I was like 16 or 17 and, and so on. Yeah. And so I was really kind of, um, I was kind of an old soul because my, my grandparents, um, I was raised by them. So uh, I, just, I, I just adopted a lot of things that they, they taught me, and I guess. Um, so there was little things along the way and as much as I don't want to say it, uh, it was always, my life consisted of facility to facility to jail to, okay, maybe I can be a, one of these prison guys and stay in jail and be violent. And, and I found I, could, I couldn't do a lot of things that I tried to do in all these facilities. And these facilities were primarily for alcohol and drugs. But when I'd end up in the jail, I just, one thing that just kept going through my head is I do not like my freedom taken away. And all the other stuff, I don't even like that. So I experienced it, I was in it. I did time for a few things. Um, not a lot of time, but enough time to figure out this isn't for me and I don't ever want to come here uh, yeah. to take, get that taken away, my freedom. So there was, uh, you know, lots of, uh, but in all of those times, the radio was uh, something that I, re- whenever I come out of a, a, an episode of abusing, and be down in the dumps and hung over. Uh, I always knew, it always, 
I'd have two or three days before I felt like I started to get back to normal. And to me, feeling normal was starting to feel good about myself and feeling like um, having a little confidence. But the radio would always be my indicator because mm. I'd start singing. I'd start singing and I was like, okay, now you're feeling better. Yeah. But before that, everything was depressing because it's like you start getting glued to what the words are saying in the song and it's like, and it's like and you look at your own life and the comparison is crappy. And So a lot of these experiences were in treatment centers and in those treatment centers people had a guitar they were musical they wrote songs um, and they would let me have some of that and so i had i had all these little hints of people and things and music through all of my and then i'd leave these places i was very good at being a leader in these places being confident and, and feeling good about myself but when i left these places i just collapsed when i tried to be like what i was talking about earlier yeah. similar Self into all of this and feel a part of society. I just couldn't, and I and I always felt like I belong here, and this is where I belong is in the alley, drinking listerine with the boys, or you know, like just like just terrible, you know, th that black and white thing. And yeah. and uh, I didn't even have the white thing. It was just more like I just felt like I just belong belong here. And so I have to credit to, I have to credit a lot of the times that I was clean in these facilities because I was, at, at that time I was confident, I was, I was, and I really started to believe in myself that I, maybe I could be musical, just maybe, and I think most of my life, I know I'm going on a bit, but I, but I think most of my life, I wanted to be good at something. And, and most of, I didn't have friends, and I always tried, because I couldn't do the things that other friends were doing, which were really simple things that I just, I was clumsy. I, I, um, I later found out now I have a lazy eye. So when I was, when somebody would throw a basketball at me when I was a kid, I never knew it at the time. I didn't know what the hell was going on. My, I would, I would, my, everything would get overwhelmed and I, usually the ball would hit me in the head or something because my eye couldn't focus. Like now, now I look back and I see things that happen in my life now and say, wow, maybe that's why I didn't like you know, when yeah. Puck was, got shot in my face because I was in the way and I couldn't move fast enough. Like, I, I think a lot of that uncoordinated stuff had to do with the left side of my body. And I later found out that my mom has a similar. So there's just a lot of things I find out later. Um, so I, I, I really wanted to be good, good at something in my life. And in these treatment centers, I found out that I was, I had leadership capabilities. I had different things in myself that I never saw in myself because I never had a chance to see them because I'd always be drunk or stoned. And mm. so all of a sudden I see these things, but then I'd go back and I'd destroy myself again and usually do something worse than what I did the last time and just that snowball effect. And, but I always remember being sober and thinking, you know what, I got, I did really well. And that would always bring me back to get, to want to get clean again. Yeah. And as deep and dark as it was sometimes. And, and the bottoms that I had were so many, some more disastrous than the other. But I'd always remember I was doing good once. And maybe, I, and, that, and that to me speaks about the depression I feel too, is I wanted that back. And I knew I could, I'm like, like I say, I'm on that edge. I, I, I know I can get that again. And how do I get that? I know there's a seven day detox process I have to go through you know, buckle down, get some Valium or something, and, and like just get through all the anxiety and, and get over there and safely without getting drawn back in through taking the pill for something. And all of these, I know I get pretty graphic about, all, about it all, but um, I just, um, it's easy to kind of lose my train of thought. But when I started to get good at things, and it started in my recovery, I started to get good at things like carpentry and drywalling and painting and it just kind of grows like um, I, I like to fix my truck when things go wrong that are not a c computer stuff I think I can figure things most I thank God for YouTube you know I can put a tie on but anyway like you know just a lot of things and interests and I'm very interested in architecture just all of these things that I never maybe a dad should have showed me growing up you know maybe a grandfather that was at more of a grade three education could have showed me but I just not to put him down, but just because they only had grade three education and they did the best they could with what, what they had. But I just saw all this stuff. And then so when I became, so the question was, um, 
What's music? <laughs> I kind of wandered off there. Um, it's a beautiful wandering. I'm not stopping you. I'm not bringing you back in because I'm enjoying it. I don't know about you, David. Yeah, it's, it's a great wonder, yeah. Yeah, keep wandering. So when I felt, um, I started to see that actually people were paying me money and after I was done a job, I could take a picture of it and they could look at it and give me what I was entitled of what I asked for for that job. And I just found that like, oh my God, like, you know, like coming from where I come from, this person doesn't know me, but they look at me as a confident contractor if they only knew what I felt like inside. Yeah. And, uh, you yeah. know, Sean, the fact that you show up, <laughs> the fact that you show up when there are times when, like you say, I can't get out of bed. Uh, my admiration for you and to share it so openly so that, you know, I know, I know your story will help many, many people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you are more than a musician. Mm. You are a storyteller and your story is, is so, so important to so, so many people. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, thanks. John, would you like to kind of give us a last song before? I mean, literally, I'd like here all evening. But, <laughs> but would you like to choose a last song before we kind of close? Yeah, I'm just gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna. There's so many things up in my head. I'm just trying to think um, what I could do for you. Um, Something that's, uh... hang on, I'm just cheating a little bit. I should tell you a quick story while Sean, Sean yeah. is, is, is doing this. I was, so Granville Island is like, it's, it's a tiny little island, isn't it? it? You know, in Vancouver. And I was in a food hall one time. And so it was the second time I was there. I was with a really lovely close friend, uh, old friend of mine. And um, all of a sudden, we literally had got our food and we sat down and then I heard Sean's voice and I said to my friend, Sean Bullshields. <laughs> I literally flew out of the food hall to find the noise, to find the sound of Sean. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> my friend came like out after me like, gee, you know, you're fast. <laughs> okay. Right. Sound like a groupie. I am. I'm going to admit it. I own that. <laughs> okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. Good. I, so, so, so my life has been uh, Granville Island. Uh, I always go back to Granville Island, and it, it, it changed. It changed the direction in my life, you know. And uh, I, I got hired to do a, a gig for a, a yoga studio. And I went to see them, and uh, afterwards, you know, and these people were very deep, very deep. Very deep. Saw so that downward dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, one of them uh, came up to me afterwards, and they were just really deep with me, and, and they were saying things that, uh, that really I started to understand. Um, but one of them said, you know, you have to pay attention to, to what's happening, and uh, there's a reason why your shoulder got hurt. And there's a reason for this and there's a reason for that and where are you now and what all of these things that have happened in your life happened just the way that they were supposed to happen for you to find and do what you love to do today just little things like that and all of these people have so many different versions of of my walk but i'm listening to them all and and and, and i know that and 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 the one word that comes out of my mouth is thank you for the blessings that that that, that have become my life, um, like that, that my life has become. And, you know, getting older, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, fingers are starting to, because I've, I've never played professionally every day and had to practice and stuff. So fingers are starting to hurt and the joints are starting to hurt. And it's like, uh, so you got to live with that too and manage all of that stuff too. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, we're going to sing, uh, so this song, uh, I learned uh, just a quick story, and thank you everybody, uh, I, I, I think maybe I have the right to say this as well, thank you for uh, listening because this is almost a great take, so um, 
we're gonna um, just thank you for listening and, and, and uh, thank you both to Anish and, and David for, for having me. Um, I, can, I still can't believe that it's 12.30 here and it's 8.30 there. <laughs> but, but it's happening. It's and, happening. Uh, Zoom, thank you Zoom. Um, <laughs> thank you Zoom. <laughs> So this song, uh, I was in a treatment center in Oklahoma. There was a song I really liked. It was called Seminole Wind. Uh, Seminole were a First Nations um, tribe in uh, Florida, Everglades, Florida, United States. And uh, so John Anderson sang this song. It's called Seminole Wind. And I uh, just, I loved it. And I will be honest, the reason why I liked it too is it had four chords. <laughs> Around and around. Yeah. So it didn't have harmonica to it, which I'm adding, <laughs> which I should check. And uh, I did a video the other day, and I was, was everything was great, and, I was, and then it was the wrong harp, so that's why I blew on it. Um, and uh, so I said, I got to learn that. So I learned those. Those are the first four chords that I started to rotate my fingers and practice my fingers um, you know, around to, to, to get where I'm, where I'm at today. So, so thank you for this song. Um, Ever since the days of old, men would search for wealth untold. They dig for silver and for gold and leave the empty hole. And way down south in the Everglades, where the black water rolls and the salt grass waves, the eagles fly and the otters play in the land of the Seminole. Blow, blow, Seminole wind blow like you're never gonna blow again. I'm calling to you like a long lost friend, and I know who you are. So blow, blow from the Okanagan Range all the way up to Micanopy. Blow across the home of the Seminole and the alligators in the dark. Grass came and took its toll, and in the name of flood control, they made their plans and they drained the land. Now the glades are cold and dry. And the last time I walked in the swamp, I sat up on a cypress stone. I listened close and I heard the ghost of Osceola cry. So blow, blow, Seminole wind blow like you're never gonna blow again. I'm calling to you like a long lost friend, but I know who you are. So blow, blow from the Okito range all the way up to Micanope. Blow across the home of the Seminole and the alligators in the garden. Wow.
I mean, seriously, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I am it. I just, I just totally and utterly believe that music is part of of everybody's well being. I, I, I really do. And to hear how your recovery has been entrenched and so connected with music, and that you represent that, you you literally embody the fact that recovery and music, along with traumatic pasts. Are just part of a healing for people, and I, I genuinely cannot thank you enough. You know, you can have all all the therapy in the world, and you can, but it needs more. And and you you have presented that today, David. David, over to you. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up because I'm gonna I'm just gonna say thank you, Sean. Truly, truly, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna ask David to talk us out you're incredible and thank you truly yeah thank you so much sean um again myself i um i don't follow that i'm saying and i can't but i'd just like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart um i will have a smile on my face which will last for a few days so i very much appreciate that um thank you for being with us it's been such a pleasure such an honor so um Thanks again and bye-bye, and I hope our paths cross in a not too distant future. Thank you so much, David, and, and thank you again, Anish. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, okay. let's get through this. <laughs>